With Tim Hortons two hot breakfast sandwiches for six bucks deal, you can mix and match your favorites. Mix and match between savory sausage or naturally hickory smoked bacon. Mix and match between an English muffin or flaky biscuit. Any two served with a freshly cracked egg and melted cheese. You can even mix and match how you share it. One for you, one for them. Two for them or two just for you. There's no wrong way to mix and match this tasty deal. Two breakfast sandwiches for just six bucks. It's time for Tim's. Limited time at participating U.S. restaurants. Single item at regular price. Modifications and tax extra. Additional terms apply. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. If ever there was a man whose house was full of trials and whose life was full of sorrows, that man was David. Trials of all kinds, wave upon wave, were continually breaking on David to the very end of his days. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history and a sermon that they delivered today. We're going back to the late 1800s to hear a sermon by J.C. Ryle. He was preached in Liverpool. Troy, how you doing? Doing great. Cannot complain. I want to say thank you. We've had several people writing emails, talking to us, sharing uh, that they've been sharing our show and letting us know. But also several people have come in to volunteer to read sermons uh, it was fantastic getting some of these voice recordings and some of these sermons out, and you may be hearing some of these new voices reading sermons for us. So that's been really encouraging to have uh, just so many new people checking in on our show and, and learning about us. I Also, I'm excited to do a sermon on J.C. Ryle. He's a great preacher, and people kind of know of him. He has a famous book called Holiness, but he's not always remembered when you're listing off the greats of history, but Ryle deserves definitely to have that spot. We've done episodes on him before, and if you haven't listened to them, I do highly encourage going back and checking them out because they're all very, very good. Not not because we're so great, but his sermons are just very, very good. Uh, but it's been it's been years since we've had we've done one on him, so I'm excited to get back in here. Yeah, J.C. Ryle. He was born in 1816. I kind of picture his childhood at you know he's like he's a rich, smart smug kid. You know, almost like a yeah. like a like a uh, who's the Facebook guy. Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg? Was he was he a rich, smart, smug yeah. kid? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I picture him like okay. a Zuckerberg almost. Yeah, he went to Oxford. He was a genius. He had all these scholarships. Uh, he was a great sports player. I got, I don't think Zuckerberg was much of a sports player. Yeah, but. that's the part where I'm having a hard time picturing that yeah, the connection. Yeah. <laughs> but but he was JC Ryle was a great sport, a great athlete. <laughs> Helped his team win many games. Um, you know, kind of uh graduated top of his class. Everyone I don't know if everyone loved him, but everyone definitely respected his uh, his hustle and his family. And he had plans to go into politics. He wanted to be, you know, in that business world, in that politics world. Go go straight. This is in England, right? So he's going into Parliament. But this was one misfortune struck because his father, unbeknownst unbeknownst to him, uh, had issues financially, and they went bankrupt. And this was a shock to him. But suddenly, their family fortune was gone and his family were broke and this really derailed all of his plans and uh, eventually ended up leading to him slowly surrendering himself to be a minister Uh, and we've done a previous episode on jc ryo you can go back and check it out probably about a year and a half old at this point but uh, that's where we're going to pick up this episode now this was a huge moment in his life this bankruptcy moment and victorian england class structures are different than you might think of them today so a family having this upper class life uh, especially at kind of this is also some of the early days of sports and he was like a real champion a real hero so in a lot of ways this was just a complete upending of your life and to go from that really rich background to the poor place that he find his family finds himself in this world where you can't really move up and down the class structure uh, very easily at all it was definitely very hard on them to lose all of this just as he was launching himself into the world. And it's not really a lot of whole kind of dust it off and try again, start a new business, not in England at that time. He also has another famous moment that I think really captures who he is, which is his conversion. He he was not that serious about God. He got sick in school, missed some exams, almost died, or at least got very sick. And this really challenged him to think about eternity and where he would go. He started attending church during this time and wrestling with these ideas and one day late into church, he was coming in and he was really paying attention to what was being said. And they had already gotten past some of the early, you know, meet and greets. And they were doing the Bible reading and they read, For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. 
He said just instantly he was converted. The Holy Spirit immediately just made him realize, I'm trying to earn it. I can't do it. It's a gift of God. I'm done. Now, this will happen a few years before. When the bankruptcy hit his family, he said it was his new faith in God that he only had for a couple of years at this point uh, had saved him. 25 years later, reflecting on it, he said, with all the world before me, I lost everything and saw the whole future of my life turned upside down and thrown into confusion. If I hadn't been a Christian at that time, I do not know if I should not have committed suicide. As it was, everybody said how beautifully I behaved, how resigned I was, what an example of contentment I was. Never was there a more complete mistake. God alone knows how the iron entered into my soul, how my whole frame, body, mind, and spirit reeled and was shaken to the foundation under the blow of my father's ruin. I am quite certain it inflicted a wound on my body and mind of which I feel the effects most heavily even at this day and will feel it if I live to be a hundred. To suppose that people do not feel things because they do not scream and yell and fill the air with their cries is simple nonsense. So Ryle began to preach as an Anglican because it earned him money and he had the education to do so. And he felt like for him, God had closed every other door in his life. So as a person, he was a bit of an intimidating guy. He was uh, very muscular. He was very tall. He was six foot four inches, which for our non-American listeners is 1.93 meters. And he had a nice deep voice. He took himself very seriously. So he had this demeanor of a wealthy aristocrat, but the heart of a sincere man who uh, had been through some challenges. And this resonated with people well. It made him a sensation amongst all the people. So he got his first post, and, and one of the reasons that he took this specific post was because it paid him an, a, enough to allow him to have a wife, was how he put it. He took he took marriage really seriously, and he, he looked to people like John Wesley, Charles Wesley, and George Whitfield, and, and he saw how rough their marital lives were, and so he wanted to make sure that there was a good amount of stability to his marriage, and then he married a good woman. And uh, by all accounts, it does seem like his his marriage was very peaceful and profitable, although not untouched by tragedy. He'd end up marrying three times. All, all three of his wives would end up dying young. Some folks don't stop searching till they find the truth. And if you've got the eye of a detective, June's Journey is the game for you. Play as June Parker in a gripping murder mystery adventure as you find hidden objects to help solve her sister's death. You'll hunt for clues in hundreds of beautifully illustrated scenes set in the Roaring Twenties. With more than a thousand scenes filled with clues, there's always something new to discover. You may even trek across the globe for your next lead. Every week, new chapters are added with new characters to meet and places to search. Plus, there are tons of fun, unique features to keep you entertained. From building your own island estate with expansive gardens and beautiful buildings, to collecting scraps of information on each character to fill your photo album. You can even play with or against other players by joining a detective club. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today, available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. With Tim Horton's Two Hot Breakfast Sandwiches for Six Bucks deal, you can mix and match your favorites. Mix and match between savory sausage or naturally hickory smoked bacon. Mix and match between an English muffin or flaky biscuit. Any two served with a freshly cracked egg and melted cheese. You can even mix and match how you share it. One for you, one for them. Two for them, or two just for you. There's no wrong way to mix and match this tasty deal. Two breakfast sandwiches for just six bucks. It's time for Tim's. Limited time at participating U.S. restaurants. Single item at regular price. Modifications and tax extra. Additional terms apply. Ryle's life seemed to be one of misfortune and calamity, yet it was these hard times and setbacks that seemed to also make Ryle the man that he was that took his faith so seriously and made him such a good, both relatable, but very sincere preacher. Many of the pastors that we have on our show give advice on preaching. It's something they they do a lot of. It's obviously very important to them, and they're considered uh, some of the best at their craft. But Ryle really emphasized what he called simplicity in preaching. He felt far too many were trying to make grandiose or sophisticated works of art, but that this was actually a distraction. He felt from the work of the gospel that they were called to. He had five points that he said made a good sermon. You may not agree with them, but I thought they were interesting. Here they are. First, have a clear view of the subject upon which you are going to preach. So you should kind of know what you're going to do and have a clear view of it. Secondly, try to use in all your sermons, as far as you can, simple words. So not trying to paint these illustrious giant pictures, but just simple ideas. 
Thirdly, take care to aim at a simple style of composition. That means just kind of put it together quickly and simply. Not quickly, but simply. Fourth, use a direct style. Instead of saying we, you should use I or you. And fifthly, use plenty of anecdotes and illustrations. I will say, if you're you know looking for the sermon side of church history or thinking about this, maybe you are a preacher and you're considering, what can I learn about these guys? Anecdotes and illustrations are a big deal in the 1800s. Uh, D.L. Moody and many others had very high things to say about illustrations and, and stories and pictures and lines that would stick in the minds of their uh, listeners for a very long time. Above all, he said, though, make your sermon Christ-centered. He thought so much of the key to being a good preacher was having a good and humble walk with God and that too many lack that. And so their sermons, no matter how well put together, lacked God. Yeah, I was getting some flashbacks to high school speech class with that with that list there. I mean, good points, but <laughs> yeah, hoof, I was not a good speaker. <laughs> <laughs> you did good. You did good in college. You weren't too bad. Yeah, it was hit or miss. I, I had some. I had some great ones, and I had some flops. But <laughs> you, I remember you holding a donkey jawbone in chapel yeah. and being like, "This is Samson. That was pretty cool. Stuck with me. It was an illustration. I there never forgot because it was there the only time yeah. I think I ever saw a donkey jawbone." <laughs> Okay, Riley, faithful preacher, especially in this tough of times, right? This is the late 1800s, so tough time to be a critic. I feel like this is one of, this is where science comes on the scene, right? This is the heyday of your Darwinism. This is the heyday of Nietzsche and, and Freud. Uh, they're all publishing works as it comes out. And so the church is increasingly questioning the er inerrancy of the Bible. They're questioning if we could really know what truth is. They're questioning uh, whether God was real or not. And in all of this, uh, Ryle is continuing to uh, preach truth. You know, he's solid in his faith. He's solid in what the truth is. In an era where many people were not, many people were adjusting their belief structure to account for these different ideas that were coming on the scene at the time. And Ryle, he, he genuinely saw himself as a missionary to the lost people of England during a time where many did not stand up for Christ or compromised what they believed. Ryle was an early example of someone who stood firm through it all and helped lead the way for others. He will be like the light of the morning when the sun rises, even a morning without clouds. He will be as the tender grass springs out of the earth during sunshine after rain. Although my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure, for this is all my salvation and all my desire. Second Samuel 23, 4 and 5. The text is taken from a chapter which should be very interesting to every Christian. It begins with a touching expression, these are the last words of David. Whether that means these are the last words which David ever spoke by inspiration as a psalmist, or these are among the last sayings of David before his death, is not the point. Either way, it suggests important things for us to understand. It contains the experience of an old servant of God who had many ups and downs in his life. It is the old soldier remembering his campaigns. It is the old traveler looking back on his journeys. Let us first consider David's humbling confession. He looks forward with a prophetic eye to the future coming of the Messiah, the promised Savior, the seed of Abraham, and the seed of David. He looks forward to the advent of a glorious kingdom in which there will be no wickedness, and righteousness will be the universal character of all the subjects. He looks forward to the final gathering of a perfect family, in which there will be no unsound members, no defects, no sin, no sorrow, no deaths, and no tears. And he says, the light of that kingdom will be as the light of the morning when the sun rises, even a morning without clouds. But then he turns to his own family and sorrowfully says, my house is not so with God. It is not perfect. It is not free from sin. And it has blots and blemishes of many kinds. It has cost me many tears. It is not as I wish it could be, and as I have so vainly tried to make it. Poor David might well say this. If ever there was a man whose house was full of trials and whose life was full of sorrows, that man was David. Trials from the envy of his own brothers. Trials from the unjust persecution of Saul. Trials from his own servants, such as Joab and Ahithophel. Trials from a wife, even that Michael who once loved him so much. Trials from his children, such as Absalom, Amnon, and Adonijah. Trials from his own subjects, who at one time forgot all he had done and drove him out of Jerusalem by rebellion. Trials of all kinds, wave upon wave, were continually breaking on David to the very end of his days. Some of the worst of these trials, no doubt, 
were the just consequences of his own sins and the wise chastisement of a loving father. But we must have hard hearts if we do not feel that David was indeed a man of sorrows. But isn't this the experience of many of God's noblest saints and dearest children? What careful reader of the Bible can fail to see that Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Samuel were all men of many sorrows, and that those sorrows chiefly arose out of their own homes? The plain truth is that home trials are one of the many means by which God sanctifies and purifies his believing people. By them, he keeps us humble. By them, he draws us to himself. By them, he sends us to our Bibles. By them, he teaches us to pray. By them, he shows us our need of Christ. By them, he weans us from the world. By them, he prepares us for a city which has foundations, in which there will be no disappointments, no tears, and no sin. It is no special mark of God's favor when Christians have no trials. They are spiritual medicines, which poor, fallen, human nature absolutely needs. King Solomon's course was one of unbroken peace and prosperity, but it may well be doubted whether this was good for his soul. Before we leave this part of our subject, let us learn some practical lessons. Let us learn that parents cannot only give grace to their children. We may use all means, but we cannot command success. We may teach, but we cannot convert. We may show those around us the bread and water of life, but we cannot make them eat and drink it. We may point out the way to eternal life, but we cannot make others walk in it. It is the spirit who quickens. Spiritual life is that one thing which the cleverest man of science cannot create or impart. It comes not of blood nor of the will of man, John 1.13. To give life is, a great, is the grand command of God. Let us learn not to expect too much from anybody or anything in this fallen world. One great secret of unhappiness is the habit of indulging in exaggerated expectations. From money, from marriage, from business, from houses, from children, from worldly honors, from political success, people are constantly expecting what they never find, and the great majority die disappointed. Happy is he who has learned to say at all times, My soul waits only upon God. My expectation is from him. Psalm 62.5 Let us learn not to be surprised or fret when trials come. It is a wise saying of Job, Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Job 5.7 Some, no doubt, have a larger cup of sorrows to drink than others. But few live long without troubles or cares of some kind. The greater our affections... The deeper are our afflictions, and the more we love, the more we have to weep. The only certain thing to be predicted about the baby lying in his cradle is this. If he grows up, he will have many troubles, and at last he will die. Let us learn lastly that God knows far better than we do what is the best time for taking away from us those whom we love. The deaths of some of David's children were painfully remarkable, both as to age, manner, and circumstances. When David's little infant lay sick, David thought he would have liked the child to live, and he fasted and mourned until all was over. Yet, when the last breath was drawn, he said, with strong assurance of seeing the child again, I will go to him, but he will not return to me, 2 Samuel 12, 23. But when, on the contrary, Absalom died in battle, Absalom the beautiful Absalom, the darling of his heart, but Absalom who died in open sin against God and his father, what did David say then? Hear his hopeless cry, O Absalom! My son, my son, if God would have it, I would have died for you. 2 Samuel 18.33 Alas, none of us know when it is best for ourselves, our children, and our friends to die. We should pray to be able to say, My times are in your hands. Let it be when you will, where you will, and how you will. Psalms 31.15 Let us consider, secondly, what was the source of David's present comfort in life. He says, Though my house is not as I wish it could be, and is the cause of much sorrow, God has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. And then he adds, this is all my salvation and all my desire. Now this word covenant is a deep and mysterious thing when applied to anything that God does. We can understand what a covenant is between man and man. It is an agreement between two people, and through the contract they bind themselves to fulfill certain conditions and do certain things. But who can fully understand a covenant made by the eternal God? It is something far above us and out of sight. It is a phrase by which he is graciously pleased to accommodate himself to our poor, weak faculties. But at best, we can only grasp a little of it. The covenant of God to which David refers as his comfort must mean that everlasting agreement between the three persons of the Blessed Trinity, which has existed from all eternity 
for the benefit of all the living members of Christ. It is a mysterious and indescribable in arrangement by which all things necessary for the salvation of our souls, our present peace, and our final glory are fully and completely provided. And all this by the joint work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The redeeming work of God the Son by dying as our substitute on the cross, the drawing work of God the Father by choosing and drawing us to the Son, and the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in awakening, reviving, and renewing our fallen nature are all contained in this covenant, along with everything that the soul of the believer needs between grace and glory. Of this covenant, the second person of the Trinity is the mediator, Hebrews 12, 24. Through him, all the blessings and privileges of the covenant are conveyed to every one of his believing members. And when the Bible speaks of God making a covenant with man, as in the words of David, it means with man in Christ as a member and part of the Son. They are his mystical body, and he is their head. And through the head, all the blessings of the eternal covenant are conveyed to the body. Christ, in one word, is the surety of the covenant. And through him, believers receive its benefits. This is the great covenant which David had in view. True Christians would do well to think about this covenant, remember it, and cast the burden of their souls upon it far more than they do. There is unspeakable comfort in the thought that the salvation of our souls has been provided for from all eternity, and is not a mere event of yesterday. Our names have long been in the Lamb's Book of Life. Our pardon and peace of conscience through Christ's blood our strength for duty, our comfort in trial, our power to fight, Christ's battles, were all arranged for us from endless ages and long before we were born. Here upon earth we pray and read and fight and struggle and groan and weep and are often sorely hindered in our journey. But we ought to remember that an almighty eye has long been upon us and that we have been the subjects of divine provision even when we did not know it. Above all, Christians should never forget that the everlasting covenant is ordered in all things and sure. The least things in our daily life are working together for good, though we may not see it at the time. The very hairs of our head are all numbered, and not a sparrow falls to the ground without our Father. There is no luck or chance in anything that happens to us. The least events in our life are parts of an everlasting design in which God has foreseen and arranged everything for the good of our souls. Let us all try to cultivate the habit of remembering the everlasting covenant. It is a doctrine full of strong comfort if it is properly used. It was not meant to destroy our responsibility. It is widely different from Islamic fatalism. It is specifically intended to be a refreshing oil for practical use in a world full of sorrow and trial. We ought to remember, amid the many sorrows and disappointments of life, that what we don't now know, we will know in in the next life. There is a meaning and a reason in every bitter cup that we have to drink, and a wise cause for every loss and bereavement that causes us to mourn. After all, recognize just how little we know. We are like children who look at a half-finished building and have not the least idea what it will look like when it's completed. They see masses of stone and brick and rubbish and timber and mortar and scaffolding and dirt, and all in apparent confusion. But the architect who designed the building sees order in it all and quietly looks forward with a joy to the day when the whole building will be finished, when all the scaffolding is removed and taken away. It is this way with us. We cannot grasp the meaning of many a dark providence in our lives, and are tempted to think that all around us is confusion, but we should try to remember that the great architect in heaven is always doing wisely and well, and that we are always being led by the right way to a city of habitation, Psalm 107.7. The resurrection morning will explain all. It is a quaint but wise saying of an old divine that true faith has bright eyes and can see even in the dark. It is recorded of Barnard Gilpin, a reformer who lived in the days of the Marian martyrdoms and was called the Apostle of the North, that he was famous for never murmuring or complaining whatever happened to him. In the worst and blackest times, he used to be always saying, it is all in God's everlasting covenant and must be for good. Towards the close of Queen Mary's reign, he was suddenly summoned to come up from Durham to London to be tried for heresy and, in all probability, like Ridley and Latimer, to be burned. The good man quietly obeyed the summons and said to his mourning friends, It is in the covenant and must be for good. On his journey from Durham to London, his horse fell and his leg was broken and he was laid up at a roadside inn. Once more, he was asked, What do you think of this? Again, he replied, It is all in the covenant and must be for good. And so it turned out. Weeks and weeks passed away before his leg was healed and he was able to resume his journey. But during those weeks, 
the unhappy Queen Mary died, the persecutions were stopped, and the worthy old reformer returned to his northern home rejoicing. Did I not tell you, he said to his friends, that all was working together for good? It would be good for us if we had something of Barnard Gilpin's faith and could make practical use of the everlasting covenant as he did. Happy is the Christian who can say from his heart these words, I do not know the way I'm going, but I do know my guide. With a childlike trust, I give my hand to the mighty friend by my side. The only thing that I say to him as he takes it is, hold it fast. Allow me not to lose my way and bring me home at last. Let us consider, lastly, what was King David's hope for the future. That hope, beyond doubt, was the glorious advent of the Messiah at the end of the world and the setting up of a kingdom of righteousness at the final restitution of all things, Acts 3.21. Of course, King David's views of this kingdom were dim and vague compared to those which are within reach of every intelligent reader of the New Testament. He was not ignorant of the coming of the Messiah to suffer, for he speaks of it in the 22nd Psalm. But he saw far behind it the coming of Messiah to reign, and his eager faith overleaped the interval between the two advents. That his mind was fixed upon this promise that the seed of the woman should one day completely bruise the serpent's head, and that the curse should be taken off the earth, and the effects of Adam's fall completely removed, I feel no doubt at all. The Church of Christ would have done well if she had walked in David's steps, and given as much attention to the second advent as David did. The figures and comparisons which David uses in speaking of the advent and future kingdom of the Messiah are singularly beautiful, and admirably fitted to exhibit the benefits which it will bring to the church and the earth. The second advent of Christ will be as the light of the morning when the sun rises, even a morning without clouds, as a tender grass springs out of the earth by clear shining after rain. Those words deserve a thousand thoughts. Who can look around him and consider the state of the world in which we live and not be obliged to confess that clouds and darkness are now on every side? The whole creation groans and travails in pain, Romans 8.22. Look where we will. We see confusion, quarrels, Wars between nations, helplessness of statesmen, discontent and grumbling of the lower classes, excessive luxury among the rich, extreme poverty among the poor, intemperance, impurity, dishonesty, swindling, lying, cheating, covetousness, heathenism, superstition, legalism among Christians, decay of vital religion. These are the things which we see continually over the whole globe, in Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. These are the things which defile the face of creation and prove that the devil is the prince of this world, and the kingdom of God has not yet come. These are clouds indeed, which often hide the sun from our eyes. But there is a good time coming, which David saw far distant, when this state of things will be completely changed. There is a kingdom coming, in which which holiness will be the rule, and sin will have no place at all. Who can look around him in his own neighborhood and fail to see within a mile of his own house that the consequences of sin lie heavily on the earth, and that sorrow and trouble abounds. Sickness, pain, and death come to all classes, and spare none, whether rich or poor. The young often die before the old, and the children before the parents. Bodily suffering of the most fearful descriptions and incurable disease make the existence of many miserable. Widowhood and childlessness and isolation tempt many to feel weary of this life, though everything which money can obtain is within their reach. Family quarrels and envies and jealousies break up the peace of many a home and are a worm at the root of many a rich man's happiness. Who can deny that all these things are to be seen all around us? There are many clouds now. Will nothing end this state of things? Is creation to go on groaning and travailing forever like this? Thanks be to God, the second advent of Christ supplies an answer to these questions. The Lord Jesus Christ has not yet finished his work on behalf of man. He will come again one day, and perhaps very soon, to set up a glorious kingdom in which the consequences of sin will have no place at all. It is a kingdom in which there will be no pain and no disease, in which the inhabitant will no more say, I am sick, Isaiah 33, 24. It is a kingdom in which there will be no partings, no moves, no changes, and no goodbyes. It is a kingdom in which there will be no deaths, no funerals, no tears, and no mourning clothes. It is a kingdom in which there will be no quarrels, no losses, no crosses, no disappointments, no wicked children, no bad servants, no faithless friends. When the last trumpet sounds and the dead will be raised incorruptible, there will be a grand gathering together of all God's people. And when we wake up after our Lord's likeness, we will be satisfied. Psalm seventeen fifteen. Where is the Christian heart that does not long for the state of things to begin? It will be well 
If we take up the last prayer in the book of Revelation and often cry, come quickly, Lord Jesus, Revelation 22, 20. And now, do we have troubles? Where is the man or woman on earth who can say, I have none? Let us take them all to the Lord Jesus Christ. None can comfort like him. He who died on the cross to purchase forgiveness for our sins is sitting at the right hand of God with a full heart of love and sympathy. He knows what sorrow is, for he lived 33 years in this sinful world and suffered himself being tempted and saw suffering every day. And he has not forgotten it. When he ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, he took a perfect human heart with him. He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, Hebrews 4.15. He can feel. Almost his last thought upon the cross was for his own mother, and he cares for weeping and bereaved mother still. Still, He would have us never forget that our departed friends in Christ are not lost, but have left before us. We will see them again on the day of gathering together. For those who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, 1 Thessalonians 4.14. We will see them in renewed bodies and know them again, but better, more beautiful, more happy than we ever saw them on the earth. Best of all, we will see them with a comfortable feeling that we will meet to part no more. Do we have troubles? Let us never forget the everlasting covenant to which old David clung to the end of his days. It is still in full force. It is not canceled. It is the property of every believer in Jesus, whether rich or poor, just as much as it was the property of the son of Jesse. Let us never give way to an anxious, murmuring, complaining spirit. Let us firmly believe at the worst of times that every step in our lives is ordered by the Lord, with perfect wisdom and perfect love, and that we will see it all at last. Let us not doubt that He is always doing all things well. He is good in giving and equally good in taking away. Finally, do we have troubles? Let us never forget that one of the best remedies and most soothing medicines is to try to do good to others and to be useful. Let us lay ourselves out to make the sorrow less and the joy greater in the sin-burdened world. There is always some good to be done within a few yards of our own doors. Let every Christian strive to do it and to relieve either bodies or minds. To comfort and to bless, to find a balm of woe, to tend the lone and fatherless is angel's work below. Selfish feeding on our own troubles and continual pouring over our own sorrows is a secret of the melancholy misery in which many spend their lives. If we trust in Jesus Christ's blood, let us remember his example. He always went about doing good, Acts 10.38. He came not to be ministered to, but to minister, as well as to give his life a ransom for many. Let us try to be like him. Let us walk in the steps of the Good Samaritan and give help wherever help is really needed. Even a kind word spoken in season is often a mighty blessing. That Old Testament promise is not yet worn out. Blessed is the man that provides for the sick and needy, the Lord will deliver him in the time of trouble. Psalm 41.1 There were so many things that could stand out to you in this sermon, uh, but one of the things I thought was interesting was just the way Ryle described David as just a man of sorrows and how he mentions like what man in the Bible, you know, isn't a man of sorrows. He specifically kind of says like, you know, when you look at Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Samuel, they were all men of many sorrows. And those sorrows uh, came from their own families. And it's true. So often the troubles of these great men of God comes from their own family life and the things they are suffering. And David probably more than anybody, you could say, maybe not more than anybody, but certainly had trouble in his own family and in his own home. And yet, despite that, Ryle also gives grace to David and goes, you know, David messed things up, but he also knew that his hope was in Christ. And that was longingly looking to him. I think oftentimes we look pretty harshly on people when they fail in certain areas or they fail in their family or they fail in ministry or wherever it is. Yet, as David is closing his life, he's looking to the hope he has in Christ and looking to the hope he has in God. And that is what David should ultimately be remembered for, a failed person who constantly looked to God. And at the end of the day, we're all going to be failed in some area, in some part of our life. And we should all be looking to our hope in God. If you've failed in your family or you feel you have failed in those areas, you can still, like David, close out your life, putting all your hope in Christ and going, where I have been weak, may he be strong.
Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Todd Nicholas. He is a husband and a father to three young children. He serves in a local preaching ministry as well as remote work in establishing Bible teaching virtual events and digitizing old sermon messages from cassette. He works on early phase research in the pharmaceutical industry. He and his wife reside in Philadelphia. He loves reading, watching soccer, spending time with family, and listening to Revive Studios podcasts. We would love to get a rating from you. If you could leave five stars on Apple Podcasts, uh, you don't have to leave five stars, but it's always helpful when it's five stars. Helps people find our show and see what we're doing. And it also helps uh, podcast Apple Podcasts kind of move things up in algorithms. And it lets other people know that you've been listening to the show. And it's always a very big help to us. So if you do not mind leaving us a five star, even better, even better if it's a written review, uh, that would help us a lot. And we would really appreciate it. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. Some folks don't stop searching till they find the truth. And if you've got the eye of a detective, June's Journey is the game for you. Play as June Parker in a gripping murder mystery adventure as you find hidden objects to help solve her sister's death. You'll hunt for clues in hundreds of beautifully illustrated scenes set in the roaring 20s. With more than a thousand scenes filled with clues, there's always something new to discover. You may even trek across the globe for your next lead. Every week, new chapters are added with new characters to meet and places to search. Plus, there are tons of fun, unique features to keep you entertained. From building your own island estate with expansive gardens and beautiful buildings, to collecting scraps of information on each character to fill your photo album. You can even play with or against other players by joining a detective club. Find your first clue by downloading June's Journey today, available on Android and iOS mobile devices, as well as on PC through Facebook games. With Tim Hortons Two Hot Breakfast Sandwiches for Six Bucks deal, you can mix and match your favorites. Mix and match between savory sausage or naturally hickory smoked bacon. Mix and match between an English muffin or flaky biscuit. Any two served with a freshly cracked egg and melted cheese. You can even mix and match how you share it. One for you, one for them. Two for them, or two just for you. There's no wrong way to mix and match this tasty deal. Two breakfast sandwiches for just six bucks. It's time for Tim's. Limited time at participating U.S. restaurants. Single item at regular price. Modifications and tax extra. Additional terms apply.